Okay, I, I aspire to be Paula because she said all of that, just, you know, no notes. <laughs> a little boat on no notes here. But anyhow, as we get started, memoir is one of the most popular genres right now. And it's a genre in which women writers have been both prolific and uh, commercially successful. There's also an argument around memoir that if we don't have narrative, which is to say stories, if we don't have stories, we don't have identity. The narrative is the way, stories are the way into understanding our identity. If this is true, then who is able to tell stories and how those stories are told becomes very, very important. Some of those women's stories we're going to be reading for you tonight. Now, in terms of organization, we're not going strictly chronologically, although in general, we're starting with classic writers moving into contemporary writers, and we're also starting with those writers that are describing childhood and then moving into concerns of um, women facing the later parts of their lives. Again, still focused around identity. Um, and issues about um, how does identity develop, what sort of constraints affect identity. Um, those are the kinds of things that I will try to be sort of alerting you to between the speakers. I'll be introducing the, the speakers and the authors between every reading, trying to give you a couple things to, to listen for in those cases. But I'll ask you to hold your questions and discussion until we finish all of the readings so that we have the fullness of voices uh, when we're done. Um, we'll have readings for about an hour and a half. Now, if anybody wants to leave during that time, you are absolutely welcome to leave. I hate being trapped in a room. So please feel free. Nobody's, I'm also a teacher, so I'm used to the students as like getting up and walking the hell out. <laughs> um, so don't worry about that. Um, but we will also give you a break between the reading uh, and the discussion so that if you need to get on to something else in your evening, you're free to do that. So with that, let's begin. And we're going to begin with Virginia Woolf, famous, classic, um, feminist, modernist writers. Of all the writers tonight, Wolf is probably the one who is most self-consciously grappling with the writing and the difficulty of writing autobiography, um, of the challenge of describing the surface and telling some truth about what lies beneath that surface. This key question of who is this I being described is going to come back again and again over the evening. Ben Lubner, who is a visiting assistant professor in the English department at MSU, going to read from Wolf's A Sketch of the Past. Okay. Uh, this is something that Virginia Woolf wrote in 1939. She would have been about 57 or so at the time, just a couple of years before her death. Um, although in this sketch, she's looking back to the earliest memories of her childhood. Two days ago, Sunday, April 16, 1939 to be precise, Nessa, that's Wolf's sister, said that if I did not start writing my memoirs, I should soon be too old. I should be 85 and should have forgotten, because it's the unhappy case of Lady Street. As it happens that I am sick of writing Roger's life, that's uh, Roger Fry, a painter and friend of Wolf's, whom she was writing a biography of at the time. As it happens that I'm sick of writing Rogers, but perhaps I'll spend two or three mornings making a sketch. There are several difficulties. In the first place, the enormous number of things I can remember. In the second, the number of different ways in which memoirs can be written. As a great memoir reader, I know many different ways. But if I begin to go through them, to analyze them, and their merits, and faults, the mornings, I cannot take more than two or three at most, will be gone. So without stopping to choose my way, in the sure and certain knowledge that it will find itself, or if not, it will not matter, I begin. First memory. This was of red and purple flowers on a black ground, my mother's dress. And she was sitting either in a train or in an omnibus, and I was on her lap. I therefore saw the flowers she was wearing very close. You can still see purple and red and blue, I think, against the black. They must have been anemones, I suppose. Perhaps we were going to St. Ives. More probably, though, for from the light, it must have been evening. We were 
coming back from London, but it, it's more convenient artistically to suppose that we were going to St. Ives, for that will lead to my other memory, which also seems to be my first memory, and in fact it is the most important of all my memories. If life has a base that it stands upon, if it is a bowl that one fills and fills and fills, then my bowl without a doubt stands upon this memory of lying half asleep, half awake, in bed in the nursery at St. Ives, it is of hearing the waves breaking and sending a splash of water over the beach and then breaking behind the yellow blind. It is of hearing the blind draw its little acorn across the floor as the wind blew the blind out. It is of lying and hearing this splash and seeing this light and feeling it is almost impossible that I should be here, feeling the purest ecstasy I can conceive. I could spend hours trying to write that as it should be written in order to give the feeling, which is even at this moment very strong in me, but I should fail unless I had some wonderful luck. I dare say I should only succeed in having the luck if I had begun by describing Virginia herself. Here I come to one of the memoir writer's difficulties. One of the reasons why, that, though I read so many, so many are failures. They leave out the person to whom things happen. The reason is that it is, the reason that it is so difficult to describe any human being. So they say, this is what happened. They do not say what the person was like to whom it happened. And the events mean very little unless we know first to whom they happened, who was I then? Adeline Virginia Stephen, second daughter of Leslie and Julia Princep Stephen, born on January 25th, 1882, descended from great many people, some famous, others obscure, born into a large connection, born not of rich parents, but of well-to-do parents, born into a very communicative, literate, letter-writing, visiting, articulate, late 19th century world. So that I could, if I liked, take the trouble, write a great deal here, not only about my mother and father, but about uncles and aunts, cousins and friends. But I do not know how much of this or what part of this made me feel what I felt in the nursery at St. Ives. I do not know how far I differ from other people. That is another memoir writer's difficulty. Yet to describe oneself truly, one must have some standard of comparison. Was I clever, stupid, good-looking, ugly, passionate, cold? Owing partly to the fact that I was never at school, never completed in any way, never competed in any way with children of my own age, I've never been able to compare my gifts and defects with other people's. Of course, there was one external reason for the intensity of this first impression, the impression of the waves and the acorn on the blind, the feeling, as I describe it sometimes to myself, of lying in a grape and seeing through a film of semi-transparent yellow. It was due partly to the many months we spent in London. The change of nursery was a great change. And there was the long train journey and the excitement I remember the dark, the lights, the stir of the going up to bed. But to fix my mind upon the nursery, it had a balcony, there was a partition, but it joined the balcony of my mother's and father's bedroom. My mother would come out on her balcony in a white dressing gown. There were passion flowers growing on the wall, there were great starry blossoms with purple streaks and large green buds, hard empty. Artful. If I were a painter, I should paint these first impressions in pale yellow, silver, and green. There was the pale yellow blind, the sea green, and the silver of the passion flowers. I should make a picture that was globular, semi-transparent. I should make a picture of curved petals, of shells, of things that were semi-transparent. I should make curved shapes showing the light through, but not giving a clear outline. Everything would be large and dim. 
and what was seen would at the same time be heard. Sounds would come through this petal or leaf, sounds indistinguishable from sights. Sound and sight seem to make equal parts of these first impressions. When I think of the early morning in bed, I also hear the caw of rooks falling from a great height. The sound seems to fall through an elastic, gummy air, which holds it up, which prevents it from being sharp and distinct. The quality of the air above Talent House seemed to suspend sound to let it sink down slowly as if it were caught in a blue gummy veil. The rook's calling is part of the wave's breaking, and the splash as the wave drew back and then gathered again. And I lay there half awake, half asleep, drawing in such ecstasy as I cannot describe.